If you look with me this morning, please, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, begin reading at verse 17, only if I may. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. The same gospel preached by the Apostle Paul that brought results is the same gospel that needs to be preached today. The same gospel that transformed sinners into saints is the same gospel that still works today. The same gospel uh, that edified the body of Christ, that glorified the Lord Jesus Christ of glory, and the same gospel that brought the kingdom of darkness to a halt is the same gospel that needs to be preached even today. If you and I will continue to preach the gospel faithfully, God Almighty will continue to confirm the gospel powerfully. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and all things passed away. Behold, all things become new. I remind you that nature itself forms us, sin deforms us, school informs us, prisons reform us, but only the gospel of Jesus Christ can transform us in this morning. In Jesus Christ, we become new people. In Jesus Christ, we just don't become nice people. We become new people. Uh, somebody's become new. A Christian just turn, we don't just turn over another leaf in the book uh, because we stay in the same old book. We take on a brand new life. I remind you this morning that a Christian receives new life. It's not like a tadpole uh, that transforms into a frog. It is not like some kind of a caterpillar uh, that transforms into a, a butterfly. As a matter of fact, all of these creatures go through a certain amount of a transformation, but they remain same in their nature. But when you and I are born again, uh, we're somewhat like a frog that's received the kiss of grace of Jesus Christ that's transformed us into a prince uh, where we become kings, of the, uh, 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 become part of the body of Christ. And for that, we are so grateful today. We are changed instantly. We are changed radically. And thank God we are changed dramatically when we've been touched by the nail-scarred hand of Jesus. Now, when the Apostle Paul accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, his entire name changed. He was at one time called Saul of Tarsus, but when he was born again, he became known as the great Apostle Paul. In my opinion, for its worth, I believe Paul was the greatest evangelist, the greatest missionary, the greatest teacher, the greatest scholar uh, that's ever been known to this world. He was a man of integrity and a man that knew the Lord. But before he accepted Jesus as his Savior, we know that he was the greatest persecutor of the church that man had ever seen. He hated Christianity and he hated Christ of Christianity. Uh, Paul himself was a Jew. Uh, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He had his own religion. He had his own philosophy. And he did not think that Christianity uh, was an offshot of uh, Judaism. He saw it to be a diabolical enemy of Judaism itself. Yeah. Uh, we know that Paul had in his, Saul rather, had in his pockets letters from the high priest that he could go arresting all the Christians uh, that stood in the way of Judaism. Uh, Saul of Tarsus was pleased uh, to arrest Christians. He rejoiced uh, when they were thrown into prison. It did not hurt his feelings at all. If they were martyred, if they were killed, or if they were stoned to death, it brought a smile to his face. Can you imagine having a religion that is so full of hatred and bias the way it was uh, with this man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And yet the Bible said that he wreaked havoc against the early church and he persecuted the early church. But on one particular day, as Saul was heading into Damascus, uh, the Bible said that there appeared unto him uh, uh, somebody uh, that the light was brighter than the noonday sun. And he heard a voice speaking, Saul, Saul, uh, why are you persecuting me? I will remind you, here in summer, Florida, at uh, 12 o'clock, if you were to take a candle and to light that candle, Candle, it would be extremely dim, would it not, in the midst of a bright sun. Uh, but the Apostle Paul said later that when, the, that when that bright light appeared to him, it made the sun go dim uh, because he himself uh, saw a great light which was 
no more than the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The light was so bright that it blinded Saul of Tarsus and he fell from his high horse and the Lord spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And the, uh, the Bible said, I am Jesus, uh, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said, go to a place in the city of Damascus to a certain house on the street called Straight, and I'll send somebody to tell you uh, what you should do. Paul was led by a blind man uh, into the city of Damascus, and the blindness came as a direct, a direct result of the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him. Now during that time, God finds a man by the name of Ananias, and he said, the Lord comes to the disciple Ananias and said, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to go to the house of Simon. I want you to find a man named Saul. I have a message I want you to deliver to him. And Ananias agrees, and he goes uh, to Straight Street, and he finds this man by the name of Saul. That's the background for the picture of the passage I want to read to you now. In Acts 9 and verse 17 we read, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus and straightway. He preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name in Jerusalem and came hither for just intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that he was the very Christ. Man, do you see what a transformed life will do? Here was a man that was bringing out threatenings against these disciples of Damascus, and a few days later, he now has fellowship with these people, and he's loving what he one time loathed, if you will. Now, let me tell you something, friend. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we have a new Lord. Know what he said. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and put hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared to you has come to me and sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. As soon as Saul was arrested by the Holy Spirit, he asked two important questions. Who art thou, Lord, and what would you have me to do? I think those are very two important questions we all need to ask. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? The Apostle Paul spent the rest of his life uh, trying to answer those two questions. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? Notice, if you will, he did not say, Lord, what do other people want me to do? Or, Lord, what am I supposed to do? But it's, Lord, what do you want me to do? I would today that every one of us in this room, everyone under the sound of my voice by internet, everyone of this world could answer those two questions. Who are you, Lord Jesus Christ? And what is it that you want me to do? Brothers and sisters, I remind you of this. Paul had surrendered his life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If we are going to be transformed alive, we must be under new management today. It's one thing for Jesus to be our Savior, but he must be our Lord this morning. I've heard it said, well, he can be your Savior, but he doesn't have to be your Lord. That's the kind of teaching that goes on in the church today that I'm not sure I really agree with. May I remind you this morning, uh, we don't go to uh, the grocery store, uh, it was our salvation, and walk through and say, well, I think I'll accept the salvation today, but I'm going to bypass him being the Lord of my life today. It does not work that way, brothers and sisters. The Bible does not put emphasis upon you and me receiving uh, Jesus Christ as our Savior. The Bible puts emphasis upon the fact you and I are to make him Lord. Too many times we want to accept Jesus as our Savior, ship our soul off to heaven when we die, but don't you mess with my life, Lord, when I'm alive. I have a problem with that kind of a salvation. If Jesus Christ has been said is not Lord of all, how can he be Lord at all? 
You say, Pastor, I don't agree with that. You better read the Bible because when I read the Word of God, I find there uh, that the word Savior, Him being our Savior, is only mentioned 24 times. But you talk about Him being our Lord, it's mentioned 463 times in the Word of God. It emphasizes Him being our Lord. It's impossible for Him to be our Lord and not be our Savior. But friend, if you and I just want to be our Savior and say, Lord, don't cramp my lifestyle today, and you've heard me say this, but we in America and culture and Christianity, we have created a God in our own mind that we want to serve. And that God that we created in our own mind lets us get away with sins, lets us get away with this, and lets us get away with that. But when you come to the God in whose image we have been created, we realize we must toe the line and live according to the book. Not as a bunch of rules and regulations, but the fact that we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He does not give us the Bible to imprison us. Thank God he gives us the word in order to set us free. I remember when I was in college, when I first got saved, I got saved. My life radically changed. The things I didn't want to do, I now wanted to do. The things I used to love to do, I no longer wanted to do them. I was changed. But I got involved with a little guy up there. He was a little bit older than me. And I thought he was, I thought he had God in his hip pocket. The guy prayed hours a day. He read the Bible hours a day. But I found out later, uh, he, 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 he always studied, but never came to the knowledge of the truth. But he had me convinced and a few others that he had convinced that, you know, we couldn't go here. We couldn't go there. We had to dress this way and dress that way. And mountain culture anyway is a clothesline sermon. You don't want to talk about a clothesline. You got to dress a certain way to be holy and you can't go here. You say, what do you believe? You tell them all the things you can't do. You follow what I'm talking about? That's where I was kind of raised when I got saved. And I remember coming to Florida and being in, in, a, in an Old Testament class, 730 in the morning. And I said, God, I was bound by sin and you set me free. But now I feel like I'm bound by religion. And bondage is bondage. And I shall never forget the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart and said, stand fast in the liberty where I have set you free. And I went, that bondage of religion. Because see, I thought I had to put on some type of a way everybody wanted me to live. No, 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 no. I can't please you and I can't please you. If I please you, I'm going to make you mad. If I please you, I'm going to make you mad. You know what? He's my Lord. Amen. I give an account to him. I don't give an account to you. You give an account to him. You don't give an account to me. He is our Lord. And when I set free, oh man, it was you talking about freedom. And he became the Lord of my life. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Nobody's saved who has not made Jesus Christ the Lord We can't have what he gives, salvation, until we receive what he has, and that's being the Lord. Let me say it again. We cannot receive what he has, what he gives, salvation, unless you receive what he is, and that's the Lord. The Bible said that if you'll confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God that raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Is he the Lord of your life? If he's the Lord, you have the right to believe that he's your Savior. You cannot have what he gives unless you receive what he is. And he is the Lord. And when you receive him as the Lord, we're going to listen to our Lord. We're going to walk to our Lord. We're going to do what he tells us to do. Engraved on the cathedral of Lumbach, Germany are these words, and I quote, You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me way and walk not. You call me life and desire me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me mighty and honor me not. You call me just and fear. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. Amen. Let me, Lord, crown you as the Lord of my life. Saul said on Damascus Road, What will you have me to do, Savior? What will you have me to do, Lord? He was bound by the lordship of sin. He was bound by the lordship of religion. 
But when the shackles were removed and the chains were broken, what were you having to do? Lord, this establishment is open under new management, praise God. It's not my will, but thy will be done. It's not what I want, it's what does the Lord want. Let me tell you, friend, I'm a servant to the people, but the people ain't my God. I serve a Lord today. He leads, he guides, and he directs. We all need to make him the Lord of our life. We have a new light. Look again in Acts 9, 17. And Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, has sent me that thou might receive thy sight. Notice what he said in verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. Paul was now able to see. I remember a few years ago, we'd been invited to the White House and, and, and Vice President Pence at that time had a bunch of us in the corner and he said, will you all please pray that their eyes will be open that they might see the truth. Amen. I have never forgotten that. Will you pray that eyes of the unsaved will be open that they might see the truth. The Bible said, the Lord is my light and my salvation, praise God. I remind you, when you receive the Lord, you receive with the Lord a new life, and you're able to see things that you've never been able to see before. Had you ever tried to read the Bible before you became a Christian? Anybody? Yeah. Make any sense to you? No. It made no sense to me. I thought, how am I gonna know how to get saved if I can't understand this? But I realized later on that the Holy Spirit of God moved upon holy men of old, to write the word of God, it takes the same Holy Spirit of God to interpret and for me to understand what the holy men of old wrote being led of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what God can do when our eyes are open to see the truth. Saul had been literally blinded by the bright light. Now he had been literally healed. However, the Lord puts here an illustration, I think, the fact that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Know what he said in John 3, 3. Or John, yeah. Except a man be born again, he cannot see. What? He cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see. We've got a lot of people behind pulpits in America that are lost as a ball in high weeds trying to tell people how to get to heaven and they don't know how to get there themselves. We've got people in college seminaries, they're lost, they don't know a thing about the Lord, and yet they can philosophically quote the Word of God, and they think they're telling people the right thing. We need to have our eyes open to see the Word of God, and to see the truth of that Word, and to see Jesus Christ Himself. We're not, we're not able to argue anybody into Christianity. We can't have enough philosophy classes, and, and use philosophy to get people into Christianity, but when they see the miracle, friend, of what God can do, when a person comes to the Lord and surrender, God removes the shackles and the scales from the eyes. Now Paul was a brilliant man. Paul had an equivalency of a PhD in his day and that didn't stand for Pentecostal Hardu and that didn't stand for a post hole digger. The man was intelligent educated the feet of Gamaliel. He was fluent in several languages. This man had it going on but yet he was bound by his religion. But as soon as he was born again, his eyes were open and he took nothing but the Old Testament scripture and he went into Arabia for three years. And there in Arabia, he had nothing but the Holy Spirit inside him and the Old Testament scripture. And God showed him depth of this word that nobody has ever seen from that day till then. It blesses my heart to know this. The disciples walked with Jesus one-on-one -on -one for three years. And they received some great revelation from Jesus Christ. But Paul did not live in that same era. And yet when Jesus Christ died and went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit of which Paul received Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He goes into Arabia and the Holy Spirit was able to teach Paul more with the Holy Spirit and the word of God than Jesus was able to teach while he was on the earth. That brings great, great consolation to me to know that you and I have the same book and even more. We can get in our secret chamber and open up the pages of God's word and say, speak to me, Lord. Show me the truth of your word. I'm so tired of drinking God's milk when he said you can have the meat of God's word that we know exactly where we're at in this last. Let me tell you, friend, you don't need to go chasing gurus and chasing prophets and chasing people. God is giving us everything we need right here to know what's going on. Grow some spiritual teeth, my friend, and let God take the shackles from off of our eyes. The apostle Paul, Paul goes in uh, to Arabia and nothing but the Old Testament. He opens it up. And when he comes out of that desert, uh, he has in his heart Ephesians. He has in his heart Colossians. He has in his heart Philipp Philipp uh, Philippians. He has in his heart the book of Romans. You know why? Because everywhere he looked in the Old Testament law, he saw Jesus. Uh, when he saw the Levitical system, he saw Jesus. When he saw the sacrificial system, he saw Jesus. When he saw Aaron, his son, inducted the priesthood, he saw Jesus Christ. When he read the Psalms, he 
saw Jesus when he read the prophets. He saw Jesus when he saw the fourth man in the fiery furnace. He saw Jesus when he saw the lion. He saw Jesus. Why? Because he took the book and the Lord removed the shackles from his eyes and he beheld the Lamb of God, my friend. Let me tell you, if you'll get along with God, get pumped up with the Holy Ghost of God and read the book, you'll find out some truth in God's Word you never knew was even there. Hallelujah. He gives us a brand new life. And I praise God for it. The Bible will burst forth like fire in our hearts. We'll be able to see the light of God's word like we've never seen it before. Thirdly, we'll have a new liberty. Look, if you will, in Acts 9 again. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now note what the Bible says. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He received power. Here was a man that was bound by sin and bound by death. But this new liberty comes through the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, we're not endeavoring to set new personal goals of achievement. As a Christian, we are energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Additionally, let me say this to you. The Christian life is not only a changed life, it is an exchanged life. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And that life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. He is saying now that Jesus Christ lives in me, which is the hope of glory. Greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world. It's as if though the divinity has moved into the humanity. Know you not, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. Jesus is not way out there somewhere. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit moved upon people and used them and lifted and went somewhere else. But today, the Holy Spirit comes into us and remains. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for the people. Today, we are the temple of the living God. Divinity comes in. We do not become gods. We are, are, are simple the temple where the Spirit of God lives that we now make him the Lord of our lives today. He is saying that Jesus through the Spirit has inhabited me. The divinity has inhabited humanity and now I'm filled with the life of God. The Christian life is what God does in me and what God does through me is I make him the Lord of my life. Let me tell you something. Christianity should not be boring. Wherever Paul went, there was a revival or a riot. Paul's life was never boring. If your life is monotonous, if your life is boring, I would say, Lord, are you the Lord of my life? Or I just got to use my Savior. Because he'll lead us. He'll guide us. He'll take us to where the action is. Amen? But too many times we just want to send our blessed assurance and say, come get me, Lord. I got a headache. Kill it. My dog's throwing up on the carpet. Stop it. I got an upset stomach. I'm not making fun of this stuff. I'm just saying, we think sometimes it's all about us. Those that live God in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. And I believe if we're living the life God wants us to live, we're going to make the devil mad. We're going to make somebody mad out there. And they're going to start persecuting you. And they're doing that. But the point is, we don't die over there. We begin to live more. When the Bible said the early church was beaten and they were flogged for naming the name of Jesus Christ, they went right back to the prayer and said, God, we find it worthy to be, worthy to be persecuted in your name. Give us some more of the Holy Ghost so we can go right back out there again and proclaim Jesus Christ is the Lord and he will change your life. We don't need closet Christians. We need men and women of God that's crowned him as the Lord and the king of the life and come out of the closet with a powerful message for the message in which we live. Come Lord Jesus. Be Lord of my life today. Let him be the Lord of your life and your light and your liberty. I gotta hurry. The spirit-filled life is not for super saints. I said the spirit-filled life is not for super saints. You don't, gotta, you don't have to be 150 years old to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul was a young Christian. Paul was a young Christian. 
And then I said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every child of God that's saved needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote later, be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's foolish and it's wicked to try to accomplish anything for God without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Well, preacher, it just ain't for me. Show me from the Word of God. I'll show you where it is for you. It is for you. I believe it died out with the apostles. Show me again where it died out with the apostles. I believe it's of the devil. Then why didn't you get it for you God's sake? This promise is of them that believe. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. This is the hour of the Holy Spirit of God. Paul was a new convert. And he said, okay, Lord, you're my Lord. If I'm supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit after I'm born again, I'm all yours. I surrender it all to you. And that's what Paul did. Friends, how can you be filled? The Spirit is not complicated. We're not talking about visions and dreams. We're not talking about weird feelings. If you will say as to the Apostle Paul, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm available to you. As we avail ourselves to him and get out of the way and let him have his way, oh, there be some great things. It's surrender to God that takes place. What we surrender to God, he takes. What we surrender, he cleanses. What he cleanses, he feels. And what he feels, he will always use. Ah, that's good stuff, whether you like it or not. Would you ask God just to feel you today? We have a new love. The Bible said, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. This was Saul certain days where the disciples were at Damascus. Now look at what Luke said here. This just greases my wagon wheel. I, I'm sorry. Look at what he's... He don't have the guts to do that again, but I'm sorry. Luke emphasized with the disciples which were at Damascus. A few verses before, and Paul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the Christians. But now, Paul's with the disciples at Damascus. Do you not see the grace of God? Do you not see the power of God that can transform lives? These Christians were, oh my Lord, this Saul is coming. We better hide. No, no, he's changed. What do you mean he's changed? He's changed. That which he once loathed, he now loves. That which he now persecuted, he's part of. That which he now hated, he now loves. The Christ he wanted to get rid of, he wants to proclaim. Can you imagine him walking in what he must have felt like? I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. I'm so sorry. I, I know what you mean now. I love the Lord. Oh, you, this is great. I love you. Isn't that wonderful? Paul is now included with Christians. When the scales were removed from his eyes, the first person he saw was Ananias, a disciple. And the first words he heard was, brother. Brother, Saul. Wow. You talk about powerful. To know such abundant love and grace where we can offer forgiveness. Let me tell you something, friend. I can't help but love you. I can't help, but you can't stop me from loving you. And I don't like everybody. <laughs> Nor do you. You can't stop me from loving you. When he's the Lord, you can't help but love. Amen. You can't help love the saws that are hurting the church. You can't help but love the politicians you'd like to put your hands around their throat. You can't help but love some of these people that are doing some of the craziest things you don't want because it's the love of Christ that constraineth me. He has poured out his spirit within our hearts. There are some people who believe you can get saved and afterwards not love Christians and not love the fellowship and not love the church. If you love Jesus, then you won't have to love what Jesus loves. We're saved. We receive the Spirit into our lives. If I say I'm born again in love and the love of God is shed abroad within our hearts by the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to say we love God if He's in our heart and do not love the saints that God loves. Amen. The church is a body. When the Apostle Paul uh, was persecuting the church, Jesus said, you, Paul, Saul, Saul, you persecute me. How are you persecuting you? I'm persecuting you. When you mess with my kids, you messing with me. When you mess with my church, you're persecuting me. You see, because it's, it's like the head and the body. He's the head, we're the body. You can't hurt one without hurting the other. To ignore the church is to ignore Jesus. To honor the church is to honor Jesus. 
There's no such thing as saying Christ, yes, and the church, no. The church and Christ are not identical, but they are inseparable, like a head and a body. A person cannot love Jesus without loving what Jesus loves and how important it is that, that Paul was with those early disciples. And you know what? Think about this for a moment. Paul walks into that fellowship in Damascus, and over there is one Christian that says, that guy was the catalyst in killing my dad. Had it not been for him, he would not have been imprisoned. He was the catalyst for seeing Stephen stoned to death, and he was my best friend. How do you think they embraced Paul? He comes in humble. I'm now one of you. I'm a believer. We rejoice. But what would you have been if you'd been in the crowd and he walked in? Turn your back just one moment. God, give me five minutes. I'll back. But can you imagine the love of God that was in their heart to accept this man by Saul who had been born again? Grace works, friend, all the way around. Grace works all the way around. You've heard me say it many times. Grace, grace, grace. Thank God for his grace. I got to hurry. We've got a new labor. In Acts 9, 20, we're reading straightway. That means immediately. He preached Christ in the synagogues that he's the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which he calleth on the name of Jerusalem? And came hither for the intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that he is the very Christ. What had been Paul's labor before? To destroy the church. What was Paul's labor now? To build the church. What was Paul's labor before? To silence the church. What was Paul's labor now? Boldly proclaim Christ to the world. The biblical mark of man and woman that's been transformed is the fact that we will bring people to Jesus Christ. Think about that. We must become soul winners. Paul moves from persecuting the church to preaching Christ and to proving that Jesus is the Son of God. We're called and we're commissioned by Jesus Christ to tell as many people as we can who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and what he can do for them. We can't do it all. We don't all do it the same way, but we all have the privilege and the responsibility to go into all the world. Share the gospel of Christ. Not to be keepers of aquariums, but to be fishers of men. Dawson Trotman, the founder of the Navigators, I'm sure you've heard of that, is a powerful disciple-making ministry. Many years ago, just prior to his death, he spoke on what is the need for the hour. And this is an excerpt from his speech. What's the need for the hour? For a beggar with a tin cup, it's a dime. For a woman being taken to the hospital, it's a doctor. But what's a Christian work? I started to list things we often feel are the need, those things which, if supplied, would end our troubles. Some say if I just had a larger staff. Many a minister would like to have an assistant. Many a mission would like to have more missionaries. Others say we don't need more workers but better facilities. If we had just more office space and more buildings and a bigger base of operation, then we could do the job. In some parts of the world, they say it's a better communication we lack or better transportation or better health care or literature. Many feel the needs an open door to some closed country, but the Bible says, my God shall supply all of your needs. If we need an open door, why doesn't God open it? He that openeth and no man shutteth, and he shutteth and no man openeth. Some say, if we just had more time, or if we just weren't so old, oh, if we're only young again. People have said to me, Dawson, if I had known, what I, if I, if I had known when I was 20 years old what I know now, I could have done a hundred times more for the Lord. Why didn't I? Often the biggest need seems to be money. Money is the answer to a larger staff, more facilities, better communication and transportation and literature if we just had more money. What is the need of the hour? I don't believe any of this. I'm convinced that the God of the universe is in control. He will supply all the needs in his own way, in his own time, all else being right. The need of the hour is an army of soldiers dedicated to Jesus Christ who believe that he is God, that he has fulfilled every promise he ever made, and that nothing is too hard for him. This is the only way we can accomplish what is on God's heart, getting the gospel to every creature. 
The need of the hour is to believe that God is God and that, he's law, that he is a lot more interested in getting the job done than you and I are. And if he has all power to do it, he's commissioned us to do it. Our business is to obey him, trust him, enable us to reach the world for him. The Lord could easily have said to the disciples, you fellows are 11 men only. You lack facilities and transportation. So all I want you to do is start a fire in Jerusalem. End of quote. But the believers in southern, southern India were glad that Thomas came to India because there Thomas was the great catalyst in bringing salvation to the Indians. You trace the origin back 1,900 years later to him. Aren't you grateful that Thomas didn't say to Jesus, I don't have a Learjet, so I can't go. He understood the words of Jesus, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. This is not only a privilege, friend, it's an obligation that we have. And as we go, we're commanded to make disciples of all people. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. No one ever followed Jesus Christ that was not a fisher of men. Church, if you and I are not fishing, we are not following. If we are not fishing, we are not following. When we become a follower of Jesus Christ, we'll have a new Lord, a new light, a new liberty, a new love, and a new labor. Mm -hmm.